Love them knives channel here back with Leong Ma hey. and we're gonna we're gonna have a discussion today uh, about the state of the industry and uh, Leong's gonna lead that discussion because I I have no idea what the hell we're talking about I'll be quiet the whole time oh bullshit oh yeah no you're leading now <laughs> you're leading now because I don't even know where you want to go with this I have no idea either well okay. what about the industry the state of the current industry well, I think it's probably like the best time because now we have access to like really high-end materials, right? Really, really top choice materials. And it's not just top choice materials here. We can actually import them and export them everywhere. And now you have like the precision and companies wanting to make really high-end materials, really high-end products. And... Man, that's like no better time to be a knife enthusiast right now. You got, you got so many choices that even your affordable choice are great choices. You know? And yeah. it's like, man, I wish I had this when I was in my teens because I was buying flea market knives and they were crap. Um, and they were, as exp they were as expensive. I mean, right now, even yeah. a Ganzo knife in D2. I mean, it's yeah. real D2. Yeah. They're bearings. They're nice. I mean, we're talking sometimes anywhere from 20 to 25 bucks. Yep. But then we've gone sub-budget, even on the new um, laconic line of Kaiser, yeah. like the Swedge over there. I mean, that's uh, they've gone into the low $40 range and ceramic bearings and either 9CR, even sometimes you're at, uh, what, D2 and or whatever. But, I mean, uh, 14C, another thing, like the Canary right here from QSP. Just got it. Just got it. And, of course, I'm not going to have it for long because it's pink and it'll go into my wife's co collection. But I got the fixed blade Canary. And then this is way cool. So this is a little Canary folder. Yeah. How cool. Okay, but, yes, I get yeah. your... So the saying? only thing is, I mean, I was having a conversation with a dealer friend of mine and he's like, man, I, I don't see, there's like no bottom anymore. So companies are like racing to the bottom <laughs> and to go broke to, well, they, 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 I hope they stop before they go broke, but they're, they're chasing after that lower price point, lower price point. And you know, it's, it's kind of scary. It's scary. Yeah. Well, I wonder if they're responding to the fact that really the market has softened some since the yeah. since the COVID years. People were at home. Yeah. They weren't going out to dinner or drinks or movies. They weren't traveling. They weren't doing this and that. And then they were getting government checks, right? Yeah. And so um, I did like the checks part. I didn't like having to stay at home. But so they didn't spend the money, right? So they were online. They were buying lots of knives, yeah. doing this and that. Yeah. And now... Those good old days are gone. Well, um, you, you can't even get people to go back to work now. <laughs> they want to stay on. They want to just stay on the computer. So see, yeah, yeah. So um, and it's 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 strange because like um, you know you got companies also trying things. Companies who traditionally made products, you know, in China and Taiwan, now they're having products made in the U.S. And then you have customers complain that it's too expensive. Yeah. But the thing is, you know. Having products made here, um, it does cost more money. And that's yeah. just something you have to deal with, you know? So, like, if you want products made in the U.S., which everyone does, it does cost more money, you know? Yeah. And, and that's just a fact. Now, and they have to pay the employees a fair wage. The employees want to be able to make a living, and they have to pay their bills wherever they're located. So it's just it's going to cost they more. They got to pay the employers part of the Social Security. They got to pay workers' compensation, insurance, and all that. They got to watch their environmental standards more in this country and this yeah. and that. So, yeah, I get that. Um, but I just don't see that there's a lot of interest in American manufacturers doing OEM work for knives, as I have said before. And I've talked to some guys at the shows, and they're going, yeah, because they if you got sophisticated CNCs and stuff, you're going to make high-tech parts, yep. aircraft parts, yep. oil field parts, or whatever parts for other industries because you make more money per machine hour. Right. So why am I making a knife? A knife is easy. And yeah. so 
that you got all these shops over in China because they got what 1.4 billion people, so they yeah. got five times the population of the United States, and they got five times the shops yeah. probably or more. Yeah. And everybody's and, a shop. Yeah, everybody's so, a shop. You know, even in houses, you'll walk by the houses and they got CNC machines oh, in God. there. And, and it's not. I need. I need one of those. And everybody's educated in school to run, to run machines. You know, to, to be able to take on those courses. Not like here where it's something that you do it after school. When you go you to know? a tech school yeah. or something like that. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a different different way to educate. So, and and all the, all the knife companies here are jam-packed. They're busy. Like if you went to them, it's not like they're waiting for you to give them a project. They already have years of projects ahead of them. Yeah. So that's the other thing is like they don't need to look for other projects there we got all these projects so and they're building great parks and so if you want stuff made here yeah you may not be able to buy as many but if you want to support them support them you yeah know? yeah well it, i'd love to see the united states bring more manufacturing back here i think there's you know because i mean a big component used to be labor but yeah. with the automation anymore, the labor part's not as big a part of the overall cost of a product. And so that's really, we should be able to compete pretty closely. And you know what? Some of these Chinese knives, four, five, six hundred dollars come on. I mean, we could do that. That would be nice. I mean, it'd just be nice to have those options. You know what I mean? That would be nice. But the four, five, six hundred dollars Chinese knives would probably cost three times more maybe here. i don't know maybe it would. i mean it, i'd like to see somebody give it a go like that but i mean i think there is some there are some oems here mm -hmm. in the usa and this yeah. and that and i've never done i mean i did one knife right the result or whatever this thing so yeah uh, will i do another knife probably not any you should do another knife. <laughs> ever so but if i did i think i would look seriously into uh, an American OEM, just to, you know, what the hell, I want, yeah. I want to know. Um, so that kind of thing. But yes, the quality is there on the Chinese uh, knives for those that are the quality manufacturers. Yeah. So. And, and, and you know what? I mean, the passion is there now. I mean, the, they, they don't want to turn out, you know, cheap knives. They yeah. want to turn out like the really good high-end quality stuff. And that's why I, I love working you know well i mean you've got all the american knife makers yeah. like eric oaks or brian nadeau or you know i mean so you got sharp by design you got chavez you got Pena, you who, who else i mean you got everybody everybody everybody, everybody. i mean yeah. even uh, i mean everybody yeah <laughs> she ferrum forge everybody because, uh, everyone tr i'm sure all these uh knife makers they tried to do a project here yeah they did and some of them are custom makers and then when they try to do like an OEM project here and, and had to wait and wait and wait, they were like, okay, let's, let's try it overseas and see if, see if that works out. So, you know, when that worked out, then good, you know, but everybody does want to have a project here. You know, it's not that we don't want to have, we do, but sometimes it, it might be well, years early when you were first doing it you were telling me you you yeah. had usa makers making your knives right. like way back in the oh, beginning yeah. i started out just designing uh knives with custom knife makers and there will be collaborations but they'll do one project and it'll be at first it'll be like six months wait a year wait and then it became two years then three years and then you don't hear anything from them and then like five, six years later, they'll be like, hey, I still want to do that project. And for me, I, you know, in my designs, I keep evolving. And I was like, you know, that's no longer what I want to do. You can't, you can't you handle know? that kind of timeline anyhow. Yeah. But I mean, they couldn't do. No, they will only do 10 pieces. They couldn't do the, that many. No, it'll be 10 pieces. And this yeah. way, like almost like all my custom projects before were only runs of 10. And, oh. and, they're, they're, and yeah. Yeah. That'd be weird. I mean, you know what would be interesting is to have pictures of your early ones that you did. Right. You got pictures saying oh, all that? Oh, I do. I do. I even have one of each one. And I was going to put oh, it. Oh, you do? We I was going to put it. We should have a video with all his super early stuff where there was only 10 of them made. So, like, I, 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 
I wanted to do that on my website, like create like an old catalog and everything. Cause I got stuff that were like different opening mechanisms that I no longer use, but I, you know, I did it before everybody else did. And my, the website guys was like, but you have none of those for sale. So why would you even want to showcase that? Yeah. There are going to be people who keep asking you to buy one of those and you don't actually have one for sale. So, you know, there's no point. Plus you're taking up bandwidth by putting it on your site. So I was like, okay, but I do have all those photos stored on my drive. That'd so, be interesting. Well, I might yeah. be get those just to put them on some kind of a video that I yeah. could do and I could just pull them up. I mean, yeah. uh, on my iPad and just do a video like slideshow for everybody right. voiceover and kind of just talk about the knives or both you and I together with yeah. the mics, you know, yeah. we could do that as well. Yeah. I mean, my first few knives were all karambits. Oh, were they? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a Rick Hinderer karambit that Rick made for me a run of like 20 or 22 of them. That was the only one that was like more than 10. And they've gone to like some of the very special people that uh, would use that. Uh, I got project with Strider and you know, some of the f more famous makers like uh, Todd Rexford and Jeremy Marsh and Sal Monero. So, wow. yeah, a lot of guys. Uh, wow. John W. Smith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, yeah, I didn't know that when you were. A so lot you were talking about when you were working in New York City. As a chef. And then you were chasing oh, yeah. knife, knife. You were going to knife shows to yeah. try and get people to see if they wouldn't produce your designs like yeah. CRKT and yep. stuff, right? Yep. So that was, that was the thing. Like I would work like anywhere from 12 to 15 hours a day. And then I'll tell my boss like, Hey, I need off this weekend just to go to a knife show. And it'll be like, just work some extra hours. And then I'll come back in Sunday night after the show and go back to work on Monday. And that was the, that was the way it was for several years until, you know, I was just like, and I thought that was going to be the way it was because I was chasing project after project after project. People would be like, don't you work as a chef? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going back to work after the show is over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So you put great. in a lot of years chasing that too because yeah. you knew you couldn't do a larger run than only so many well, nights I mean, the thing a is, USA maker. You, the maker could do more, but you want to keep it at like 10 just to make sure like the value was always there. And like, you know, this way, like people knew like what they're buying. And, and I still have the collectors who, you know, they still have the knives. And a lot of them went overseas. A lot of them went to Russia and China, wow. you know, so yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. when you, when did you actually start doing like more volume was it when you hooked the, up with riyadh on um, or was it oh yeah yeah today? definitely because there was a minimum order oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that was a minimum order I understand so that. my first project was uh, the warrior one and that was 300 pieces and i was like oh my god how are you going to afford that how am i going to well people i are I, doing pre-sales now but yeah not back then right back then it was like I was one I was one of the first ones, right? And so none of the stuff that's happening now was even like known, right? And like we I didn't know how to sell. So um and I just started being on Instagram and Facebook and it was just like how am I going to reach so many people? How am I going to do that? And it's just like it was such new territory that you know, it was sort of like that scary and excitement at the same time. <laughs> Terrifying. Terrifying. And, and you're like, okay, I got I, I to gotta pay all this money for, for all these knives. And then just trusting someone who's, that you never met overseas. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, you were yeah, yeah. talking about, and, like, and, good Lord, I'm giving tens of thousands yeah. of dollars to some guy halfway around the right. world, and I don't even really know him. And then I, I found David uh, on Facebook somehow I found him and I was messaging him I was like are you the same David who owns React Knives it's like yeah I'm like I bought one of your knives the Horizon A and it's okay. really I good I, I, I want I want to do a project and and then I told him I was a designer and I was like he probably never heard of me. he's like I've heard of you before I'm like oh holy shit okay wow. and then I had to get the design send it to him and I was like God I got to send my IP overseas 
to somebody in an email and I'm like oh my god this is so scary and then I had to and then he's like oh the design looks good we can make it uh, how about we make two prototypes first and they just charged me several hundred dollars right, for the prototypes and I was like now he has my design and I'm sending him yeah, hundreds of yeah. dollars oh my god and then, <laughs> but then you know after about a month uh, the two prototypes came um, and I flicked them, and I was like, wow, if he can make like 90% of them like this, I am going to keep working on him. Yeah. And he did. And, so how many years ago was that? This was 20, like late 2014. Yeah. 2014? Yeah. So right after I, I moved down to Florida well, that and got my home. Well, that that long ago. Nine years ago. Nine years ago. Oh, it's only nine years yeah. ago. Well, hold on. So yeah. you had the 18 that you did to celebrate 18 years. Yeah. So, but you were, okay, so that I, I'm was... counting all the, all the years I did as a custom design, too. Okay. Yeah. Nine years in front of that. So yeah. you've been doing it for, what, 20 years now, at least? 20 years, at least. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really, like, I would go to work and come back and draw in my notebook and then try to put it into CAD. And that was really like a way to like, kind of like relax, you know, like my, my drawings. And I have so many drawings that most of it would never become an actual product. But yeah, I love drawing, you know. Yeah, don't worry, your parents a little freaked out. You were how old when you were drawing Oh, I was drawing, knives? I was drawing knives in my like school textbooks, my school notebooks. And they're like, but back then they didn't send you to no psychologist, you know. <laughs> They, don't, they didn't think that there was something wrong with you because you, you could draw knives, you know? But, yeah. But so yeah. you arrived in New York City from Malaysia when you yeah. were nine years old, right? Yeah, uh-huh. In 83. So that must have been a culture shock. You know, it wasn't so bad. So the, um, we, we stayed with my uncle and aunt for like six months before we got our own home. And, but instead of putting me in public school, I went to Catholic school. Right, and um, it was really cool. Like, you know, even though I wasn't Catholic, um, they welcomed me in. Um, my teachers were awesome. And, and, and whenever I go back to my own neighborhood, I still bump into a couple of them, you know? And it's like, yeah, they're great. They're great. Yeah, my wife went to yeah. Catholic school too. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a different kind of thing. But, yeah, I mean, she got a good education there as well. Yeah. And then my brother-in-law, which is her older brother, he went to the same Catholic school. But then he went to this other Catholic school called Notre Dame. <laughs> Notre Dame. How did he get in there? I think somebody pulled some strings kind somewhere of in the family. What was a real culture shock was when I graduated eighth grade and, and went into, like, public high school. That was a culture shock. That uh, was like because you whole, couldn't go the whole way in the Catholic. You no, did. I could have. Oh, you. Could've. But then I was like, you know, mom. So I, you went I, to public. I, I want to go to public high school just to see okay. what it's like. And I was like, holy shit, this is different. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet it was because that would have been, you know, after I was already. I mean, you're way younger than me, so yeah. that would have been where everybody's very relaxed in the uh, way that they yeah. dress and yeah. do things and. And like, you know, like New York City actually did like a, like a survey of like the most violent high school, like after I graduated the high school and mine came in like ninth or 10th or something, <laughs> like the most violent of all the incidents. But the thing is, you know, I never had any incidents. Hmm. Yeah. Everybody was cool with me. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. So could oh. you speak English before you came? Oh, yeah. When yeah, you yeah, yeah. Oh. So Malaysia is a British colony. Oh, so yeah. everybody speaks English. Okay. At least, like, some form of English. They may not have a lot of practice. And that's the same thing. Like, when you go into Southeast Asia, English is taught in schools. But most of them are embarrassed to actually speak to you because they feel like if they, if they get it wrong... Um, you know, you might laugh at them or something. And I tell them, like, no, they just, you know, when someone who's English speaking is coming to you for help, they actually need the help. So if you're trying, they really appreciate it, mm -hmm. you know. And I've been in airports where, you know, as soon as they hear that my English is pretty decent, mm -hmm. they're like, no, 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 we're not, we're not speaking to this one because this English is actually decent. I'm like, don't worry, I, I need the help 
trust me, I need the help. I'm okay with you, you know, having some broken English. So how did you learn to speak Cantonese? My parents are Cantonese. So, oh. yeah. My dad, who could speak like um, probably four or five different Chinese dialects, didn't learn English as much besides learning how to curse someone out in English, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's about it. And uh, so I, I was able to maintain my Cantonese just speaking with him because my mom was, was, went to an English school in Malaysia. She went to an English Catholic school in Malaysia. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But she spoke Cantonese as well. Yeah, she speaks perfect English and perfect Cantonese. Now, so when you talk to David at Riyadh, you can speak to him in, in Cantonese. Cantonese. But they speak Mandarin in China. But, but the town... The town that uh, the factory is in is actually uh, Yanjian, which is a suburb of Guangzhou, mm -hmm. which used to be called Canton, where Cantonese came from. So Cantonese is still spoken, but it's usually spoken in the house. Whereas if you were doing business, you would speak Mandarin. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It would be like... It would be like in Italy, where like the locals will, will speak their languages at home, but they are, there's an official Italian dialect, you know. So Guangzhou, yeah. isn't that the where they're making all these knives? Almost oh my God, all yeah. of them. Well, Yanjian is the is the town. Yanjian. Yanjian. Okay. Okay. So when you go to Yanjian, it's it's a huge town, and everything metal comes out of there. So you know, scissors, nail clippers, kitchen tools, kitchen knives. All the pocket knives. Well, it's like Kaiser, Best yeah. Tech, all yeah. those. Yeah, right they're, there. All, they're, they're all they're all very there. they're all very close to one another. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was wondering. It'll be like like when you go into like uh, Oregon, you will see like CRKT and Kershaw and Gerber, and they're co they're close enough to one another, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So who were you with? Oh, you met uh, David Sun, who was the Kaiser rep at the time. He was. When you were over there, right? He was actually there at the same time I was the first time I was there, and he mm -hmm. recognized me, and I said hello. Yeah. yeah. And then he introduced you to, because he uh, used the to be CH, with the, the, CH. the owner of CH, CH yeah. which is what Chen Peng or is I that don't his even name? remember his name yeah. now. I'm so embarrassed. The owner of yeah. CH knives. So yeah. I'm going ah, and he used to work for Kaiser. Yeah. Dave used to work for Kaiser. The guy at Shield and Steven, he used to work for Kaiser. Yeah. I think you're going to see sure. more and more of this. It's like, you know, it's like everybody who are. Uh, they learn the trade, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're like, I want to do my own thing a little bit. And they go out and they see if they can make it, which yeah. is a great thing. Because I'm sure even the guys at Riyadh, they work for somebody else first. And then they try to see like what they can learn. And then eventually they, they pull their money together. And then they start their own thing. You know, and, and you know, so it's, 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 a, it's really entrepreneurial. Yeah, you know? oh God. Yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, you yeah. know, if they if they have the, like, the knowledge and then mm -hmm. the, the, the energy and then the, the drive to go do it, yeah, they go do it. Yeah, you know? I mean, because, oh. like, Kaiser broke out. Who was it? Kim Ning left Kaiser you, you and started Cansev. You know that way better than I do. Yeah, and Joyce <laughs> was at Kaiser, and she went to Cansev when he went. Yeah. So Kim Ning is the guy there. And then is David's son, is he the, does he actually own Beyond EDC? I think so. Some? I think that's his, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and they're going to hook up and do some Daryl Ralph production. Well, Dal yeah, Ruff is gone. Well, I know. Yeah. And so he got with the, the family yeah. and on some of the, you know, Darryl, famous Daryl Ralph designs mm. like Dominator and this and that. Yeah. And so apparently that's coming down the pike last I heard from David. That's pretty and cool. And so, yeah, and I, yeah, he showed me one that was like a prototype thing. And I go, that's definitely Daryl Ralph design. So they're going to do that. And of course, they pay the family so yeah. much to do those designs and stuff. So that's interesting. Bring back the old, oh God, the Cuda Max. And then the one that was like the seven inch blade, that Cuda Double X or whatever Max. I had one at one time. I should still have that. Oh, that was one you don't, you don't sell. So FYI guys, Lee has a lot of knives. <sighs> Again. A lot. And a lot of flashlights. If you guys need anything, 
<laughs> you should just message him. Like, now, hey, just go to my website. Don't get into my personal stash. Do, do you just have a spare website. one laying around that you're not doing anything with? Oh, I only got these 500 that are just laying around for no reason. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but most of mine are budget knives. You can take a whole drawer out, and it's like, okay, so everything <laughs> in here is probably worth the uh, five hundred bucks together. Yeah. Most guys got a knife that's five hundred bucks, just the one knife. Not me. Mine's yeah. a whole drawer full of joy. Yeah. But guys keep asking me, okay, if you could just have, would you rather have just one expensive knife, or a dozen, you know, budget, crazy, you know, yeah. knives? And you know what? I think I think a mix I like of, the I like the little budget. If that's yeah. all you're gonna do, I mean, you don't have a huge huge budget. I, um, I like having multiple uh, different knives because yeah. you know what? Like you were saying, a little bit of both. These are well, yeah, but these are yeah. Well, that's why you got the Eutectic line yeah. going on because that's also feeding that budget craze. But you know what? These knives, the you know, twenty years ago, uh -uh, not in this price range, were not that good. But now they are. They are that good, and they're worthy to carry and use. So yeah. hey, we're, you know. Hey, if you're gonna actually use it, get it dirty, scrape it, chip it, whatever, carry a budget knife, and then carry the nice one to show all your friends. Yeah, because I ain't taking my field duty with the winter storm, fat carbon, and all that out there to bang away. But I've got my bangers. I mean, they're all around the house. <laughs> everywhere we're just looking around the room going oh god <laughs> okay. so so that's the state of industry so that we you know talk about the industry we just talked about your bio oh my god what about the state of the industry? oh my god so what do you think i mean i development think development of steels i think there's going to be about? a lot more steel marketing right like the latest craze is is uh, this and then there's going to be a next craze and then a next craze and people have to see if the if if those new steels are actually you know what they want i think there will be a push coming that where people are going to go okay it's nice to have magna cut but it's only nice to have magna cut or m390 or whatever if it's in the proper heat treat protocol to where I actually get performance for my money because it's a name and it's supposed to be good or it has a potential to be really good, but is it? And I think that's going to be the next push. I mean, they came the, the, from the, you know eight CR, right. and there was D two, then but, all the but, but what is the, the 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 nice heat treat? Like for me, coming from a kitchen background, right? Kitchen knives were never ridiculously hard. Because we no. would put it through the steel oh, yeah, yeah. on a daily basis. And then once a week, we'll actually sharpen it on the stone. Mm -hmm. Right? So anything in the you know mid-50s was great. Right? And, yeah. and we don't, don't even talk to us about like steel types. Because none of us would know what uh, each kitchen knife would be until now. Until now, we actually put the, the name of the steel on it. Yeah. Right? But 20 years ago, none of us knew. No. Okay? No, you didn't. Um, and so now they're, you know, I think anything in the mid to high 50s is great. And as a manufacturer, we want to stay in the happy medium, what we call it. Because when we sell a product, we have no idea if the person who bought it knows how to resharpen a knife. Or yeah. actually knows how to take care of a knife. So if we, if we make it too hard... Um, let's say they chip the blade, then I get, uh, uh, uh <laughs> I get yelled at for making, for getting the, giving them a knife for the, that, that the blade chip, even though they did the chipping, you well, know? Isn't there stories of like early Chris Reeve knives or some other brands where, I don't know anything about where that. they were hard to sharpen? And so, I mean, you have to address that as yeah. a, as a, as a manufacturer. It's as like, some people, so everybody bitches about everything, right? Yeah. So, oh, it's too hard to sharpen. It's like, why do you buy M390 then? Because it should be at a 62. Right. And yeah, it would be optimum. But then again, don't bitch that it takes forever to sharpen it. Send it to somebody then. Because you're, you're pushing the manufacturer towards not getting it to 62 because they don't want to hear the, the grief. Right. Because that's, that's, that's the other side of it. When we do do something like that, 
then we get the grief from complaints that people who couldn't take care of it or they break the blade. Yeah. And for Probably something that's high end like uh, my Leo Mon knives, mm -hmm. there aren't any extra blades because they're each one of them is like a handmade knife. Yeah. Right? So we stay in the what we call the happy medium. You make the knives hard, but not overly hard. Now, if a customer really wants, let's say they 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 get a particular steel that can go up to like 64, which I don't know why anyone would want a, a blade steel that's 64 Rockwell. Depends. Okay. Just like my underwear. Depends. <laughs> I mean, 15V, that should be 65, they, they, 64. They, they, they should contact a custom maker. Yeah. Well, and that's always the answer. And that's always the answer. half the yeah. custom maker built them a knife yeah. in that specific yep. Rockwell. Doing their own personal heat treat. Doing it, yeah. Because that will actually make sense then. Mm -hmm. But as a manufacturer that sells knives, we're never going to... When they're running 300, 400 We're never going to take it up to, knives, to, yeah. to dare because it's like, we're going to get so much grief from people and we have no idea how they, can how they take care of their knives. Well, you get variable hardness anyhow because yeah. your heat treat ovens are so big that the, you can't hold the consistent no. temperature then. And, and so, no, you get variable hardness yeah. anyhow. I mean, my friend Alan... Uh, who lives like five minutes from me, he, he treats each blade in his own foil packet, you know? Mm -hmm. So you kind of need to do something like that so you well, can yeah. control each one and then, you know, temper it and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. That's when you know you get a specific Rockwell hardness. Yeah. So if you want yeah. if you want a blade in Magna Cut in a certain thing, then, yeah, go to a custom knife maker. I mean, that's the, I think that's probably one of the actual big perks about getting a custom oh, yeah. knife made is that yeah. you can actually request hey i want a zirconium backspacer yep. and i want you to i mean i knew this guy up in chicago and he would contact the individual makers mm -hmm. and i can name half a dozen of them that he went to and goes you know no i want the pocket clip to be like a snake and i want the backspacer to be mm -hmm. a certain way and the guy i've never made one of my whatever knives with that and yeah. he'd want it bigger or smaller and he'd want moku tie on the bolster and this and that and so the guy make it for him because the guy's gonna pay and the maker can make it but had never done one like that and so you get a one-off that yeah. nobody's ever had and the maker had never even made before but there you go and yeah. so that's the joy of a custom knife that is and that's that's where it should be because like you know um that way you can go say, hey, I want this handle material, I want this blade finish on it, I want this kind of grind, you know, I want the grind to be up this high, I want, you know, and this is, then it's really your knife, yeah. you know. And that, that is the nice thing about yeah. a custom knife. Yeah. And then you got the mid techs, which are really now starting to blend with high-end production. It's like, it, what's the difference between like a limited edition Wii knife that's smooth, like my well, Zephyus uh, and stuff like that, and some of these mid techs. A lot I of the know. lines are blurring. Yeah. So yeah. mid tech was a term that Ken Onion came up with, and this is like probably over 20 years by now, right? And he came up with that because he wanted to be able to utilize technology, uh, CNC machines. Mm -hmm. And back then, it was still like he hand ground the blades. Right, that was the term mid tech. So he did some of the work, and the harder stuff, which required precision, that was done on machines, and that way, and he was honest about it, and that's the key. He was honest about. It. He didn't call it full custom. He told everybody it was, you know, there was technology involved, and but now it's like such a gray area, you know. Yeah, because you're almost a fool not to use high-tech equipment because it makes it seamless. It makes it smooth. I right. mean, that um, <clears throat> one reviewer was going, yeah, it's a custom knife, so it has that those character traits on it. Character meaning it's not perfectly centered or it's not smooth as glass in the drop or the detent's not really dialed in all that well, but it's handmade. And so... It's like, maybe save me from the handmade if that, you know? And so then the custom makers are then employing the high-tech machinery to make it really pretty seamless. Yeah, and if they were, if they were doing the, the thing that kind of like what 
they're well known about. Like when you look at a hand ground Walter Brand blade, you can tell he ground that blade, right? Mm -hmm. And the deep hollow grinds, the really, you know, gorgeous finish on it. That's what I would buy a Walter Brand for, you know? And now it's kind of like, I would rather buy the factory knives because the factory knives are awesome. Yeah. And, and my knives are all hand ground, you know? And yeah, all the blades are hand ground on my knives. Wow. So that's why, that's how we could get the hollow grind on the Tonto and then the flat on the tip. Yeah. Because someone actually hollow ground in and convex the tip. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't know that. All the fuel duties, they're all hand ground. Mm. You know? I don't want to be that guy. Actually, it's a woman who grinds. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. They have uh, men and women grinding there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I'm, it's an equal opportunity business over there, all right? I bet it is. They don't, they don't just keep the women out of the shop. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that's... Yeah, man. I don't know if I could be standing doing that grinding. Oh, they, they, they do it sitting down. You're young, you're healthy. Okay. They do it sitting down. They okay. sit down, and then they, they have to wheel like in front of them. Okay. And they're sitting down on a bench, and they're like, hmm. That's a very Asian way, because I heard like the Japanese also sit down when they do blade grinding. Hmm. I've never visited a Japanese uh, knife shop before, but uh, maybe one day. One day. Hmm. You know? Yeah, I don't get to travel. I haven't been overseas. Dude, ever. get out there, man. Ever? Get out there. You'll love it. Been to Mexico, You'll been to it. Canada, never been You'll overseas, never been to Alaska. Oh, my God. I don't want to go anyplace cold. Man, my blood is thin, dude. <laughs> well, you've been living in Florida you, so long. You're going to see me in like a triple down jacket, you know, during the day. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. So you've been living in Florida 13 years? Uh, like 10 years. 10 and years. And then I lived in the Dominican Republic. But I grew up in New York City. So, but once I moved out of New York City, man, I can't take the cold like I used to. Like well, your mom was, still lives up my there. My mom still lives, and I go up for the holidays. I'm going up for Thanksgiving. I'm going up for Christmas. Um, but, man, when I go out there, I'm like, oh, man, this is cold. And it's not even the cold, cold months. Like, usually February and March is the cold, cold months, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to be there during that time. Yeah. No, no. I, I grew up in the north, and yeah. Yeah, I remember people on snowmobiles in mid-October <laughs> going up and down the street in front of my house. It's like, holy shit. And that, we hadn't even had our uh, homecoming dance yet or something. It's like, oh, uh, man, this is not right. And then you don't see the ground until mid-March or late or whatever. Oh, my God. Yeah. So... It's it's changing though because I kept my SUV running, so I've warmed up the entire planet a little bit. That's okay. Hope you guys appreciate that up but there in the north. It's, it's only it's only warm places for me from now on. I know, but ooh, it, yeah. Yeah. If you got a swimming pool, you don't have a swimming pool. No, do I don't. I have a I have fruit trees in my yard. I don't either. I don't yeah. even have fruit trees, and I don't have a swimming pool. And I told the wife, I said, if we're gonna come down here. Because her brother moved from West Palm over to Little Lake Placid to on a lake. And there's about six or seven lakes within five mile radius <laughs> of me. Okay, there's shitloads of lakes. But um, I go, okay, if we're going to move to Florida, southern Florida, I want a swimming pool. Okay, I want a swimming pool. Do I have a swimming pool? No, I don't have a swimming pool. He has I got a, a lanai. He got a hot tub in the line. Yeah, I got a blow up hot tub. Now I'm I'm I am lobbying hard for a full size, you know, normal hot tub in there. I go, so I got screwed out of the swimming pool. At least I can unplug the hot tub during the summer and pretend like it's a micro swimming pool. And anything where I can hold a cold beer and be in the water when it's 96 degrees, 80 percent humidity, heat index 108 or whatever. Most of us would just stay inside during that time. See, Floridians, I mean, they do. They stay inside. And we we stay uh, inside. You know, well, during I mean the summer, but you know we winter. stay inside the house. We're not unless like I'm going off on my walk, you know, yeah. which I know I'm gonna come back and be all sweat. Yeah. 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 But uh, do you do that walk in the morning? 
I walk in the afternoon during like the massive sun, like when the sun is like, like hitting. What? Yeah, that's when I sweat the most. Well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. She, I, I mean, I look out the door. As long as the sun's just starting to peak up, there's people in here. A lot of retired people down in so But I mean, they'll be out walking, taking their poopy dogs with them or whatever. But they'll be out walking, walk, walk, walking. Okay. Yeah. But it's in the morning. It's not in the middle of the afternoon. I do in the middle of the afternoon. It's crazy. Yeah. No, no. I see them golfing across the street. You gotta join them, man. Not in the middle of the afternoon when it's 96 degrees. I ain't doing that. Oh, sometimes it it feels like it's about to rain. So, you know, it's super humid. It's like super humid. And I'm going out for my walk. I'm like, damn, it's hot today. That's the one thing. You can't count on anything during the afternoons. Because, yeah, I mean, it will... Pop up thunder showers, and it's not like if you live in the Midwest, you got a, a thunderstorm that goes 100, 150 miles long and across the whole thing. No, these are it's raining in your backyard, and your neighbor it's not raining across the street, it's not raining at all, or maybe oh. in your front yard, it's not raining. It's just it is so weird, um, yeah. And they well, does it every damn day during the summer, and, and the torrential storms where you can't even see outside your windshield yeah. when you're driving. It's yeah. like, yeah. I know. When we were coming back from Cocoa, uh-huh. Florida, not Cocoa Beach, but Cocoa, and then, of course, we were coming mm-hmm. past the Palm Bay exit and all that. We were going in and out of torrential rains, yep. but it would just be dry, and then, bam, it would, you'd go right into another spot, and you, you were going 75 miles an hour. All of a sudden, you're going 55, and you could barely see out of your windshield. It's that's, insane. That's- that's, that's how you get your car wash here. That you get the free car wash. You get the free you car wash and wash all the bugs off your off your windshield and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, what else about the industry? What else about, I just see massive growth. I think this is, okay. new. it is a golden time for nice. Uh, I, I, I mean, see massive growth. I also see it's a crazy time. And, and really, like, for a customer, you got to be, like, in front of a customer all the time. To make sure, like, they remember who you are, you know? Because there's so much out there. There's just a lot. And everybody's putting on their A game, you know? So it's like, yeah, you got to be out there. You got to keep being out there. Even when you don't feel like being out there, you have to be out there. Marketing over and over. And I see people on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, they design a knife or whatever, and they're posting that that knife Mm -hmm. Three times a day on Instagram. Boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. They have to. And continually because they, they want to keep their, yeah, they want to keep their product in front of your face. Yeah. See, I'm really lousy at that. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd be having the result on my Instagram like 20 times a day. But I'm no, d- I post it and then like 10 days later, maybe something else. Two weeks later, you know. And people, there were people that I sent one to do a review here and there. And they go, oh. We didn't even know you had an eye. We, we we didn't know anything about it. Um, so you, you're not you're not a good pimper, my friend. You're not no, a good pimper. Yeah, I, I've been slacking pimp. myself. I used to pimp at least. I used to post at least three times a week, and now I post like once, maybe every two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. So I need to get back on that. I need to get back on that horse. You well, know? and we need to do more um, videos where we just discuss different topics. Yeah. Yeah. For what the hell? Yeah. Why not? I mean, maybe people would enjoy just this. But I mean, you know what? We, I mean, I'm not. I've, I've maybe done two live feeds in the last five years. Yeah. I, I need to get back into maybe doing that too because the good thing about the live feed is people come on and they talk to each other in the right. comment section, right? right? Yeah. So it becomes a town hall. And I've seen a lot of those live feeds and. People really like to click into them because they like to see who else is right. watching and making comments. And so it becomes like a town forum. You know, I, I think that's are... important because like as we get into this, it's not like, you know, I'm standing on a hill and everybody else is like down here. It's like I'm standing down here with everybody else. And I think that is going to be, you know, the most important key factor it's all relationship building. So if any of you want to send me a message about a particular model or something that you've been dying to ask me, feel free to reach out to me, you know? And I think that point to the town hall is that 
sometimes you feel like someone is unreachable, but all they want to do is for you to reach out to them and talk to them. Because at the end, this is all about community, you know, and um, creating community is where we feel like, where we can know, like, people appreciate our work, we're actually doing this, and there is, is a reason for us to stick around doing it, you know, and, and that's all it is. You know, we want to build a community and we want to see our customers actually using our work and, and, and taking care of it. And, and then if they have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to be reachable, yeah. you know, for people, yeah. especially yeah. if you're doing this and you're selling yeah. your own designs and your own knives. Yeah. Me, I'm just selling uh, consignment knives. So. Yeah. They're on the website, and I do. I get probably four or five um, inquiries from people through the website every day. Like, I got some knives I want to sell. What's the what's the what's the process? Yeah. And then I send them respond to that. And or you know, I see this one. Do you have this other one too? Or do you happen to own whatever? And yeah, I mean, I can answer different or. Is there any voids in the carbon fiber on this thing? I can't see, you know, I don't know. So I'm going to try and take even more detailed pictures going forward of my knives that I put on there, of the consignment knives. But also I'm there to answer, yeah, those yeah. questions as well. Yeah. And I can email you back more detailed pictures if you want. Because some of these knives are two, three hundred dollars. I mean, it's an investment, so mm -hmm. you need to know that up front. Not like you can't return it, okay? But you might want to know up front anyhow, you know, to avoid the hassle of returning something. Yeah. So, and, and we're gonna be at Blade West in a few weeks. Yes, we will. Yes, and, we will. Uh, I love going to shows, even though some of it is a little stressful to get ready for the shows, but. The reason why I go to shows is to meet people. Yeah, see, you know? yeah, and I, yeah. I like going to them yeah. to do videos to bring that experience to yeah. my viewers. But you know what? Um, when you go to the shows, like Shot Show, you can't sell anything, so you're there to right. show retailers or wholesalers, whatever, get together, right. so you can talk, you can have a video. At Blade, Atlanta, West, whatever, they're busy selling knives. They're selling knives. So yeah. they ain't going to stand around and do a 20-minute video with you. So I get that. I just grab what I can. I talk to people for a few minutes here or there. But it's fun to it's fun. stay yeah. in touch with them, to meet them person to person. So, you know, you develop a relationship. Right. And in this community, it is about relationships. Right. And, you know, everybody's really nice. I mean, there's just there, there's never any like problems there's never any no, angst and, and, or and nastiness if there, if there or is anything. you can you can talk to the person right there yeah and everybody's way cool because they're all about knives and they're all knife addicts and they have all been living in denial about their addiction and we reinforce each other's addiction. You mean we and all spend way too much money on our, our is, on our addiction? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Hell yes. And I don't see most of these guys dragging their wives to there because their wives are going, you told me that Leon Ma knife was only 50 bucks. That's 500. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to leave you with oh our knife of shame of the day. Okay. This is uh, one that I got in from a guy who wanted me to put it on my website and i said oh hell no um because it's just too lovely it's too lovely so what the hell is this i just grabbed it off the table i have no idea okay what is this is uh oh oh this is lovely you guys come on oh Don't okay wow. right but it's twice as nice because look at that yeah and this is uh there look you go oh my god what does it say M Tech from the local gas station. There you go. He has a whole bucket Official of these guys. Gas station knife. And I've got 12 of them. Yes. I will sell for $120 for all 12. That's $10 a piece. You can practice your grinding skills and everything and your handle modding techniques. And how do I even close? Oh, these are liner locks. Okay. Look at this. Oh, now we're. Oh. Okay, so that's our knife of shame. 
of the day. Run out and get you a, is that Venom? It says Venom. Venom. Whew. Great name. Horrible knife. Horrible, horrible knife. Okay. And yeah. is that it? That's it. Okay. That's it for today. So I'm gonna kick him out now. He's got to go back to the East Coast. I got to go back to Palm Bay. So <sighs> where he's got oceanfront, beautiful beach right in front of his house. Do yeah. you mean like the puddle in front of my uh, <laughs> garage? In front of my garage. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, okay, that's oceanfront. Thank you guys. Yeah. Hope you to guys. see some of you in a few weeks at Blade, Blade West, West in Utah, and uh, we'll check you out on the next one of these. Stay sharp. Take care.